Hello and welcome. You're watching Coronavirus Facts versus Myths. I'm Gargi Rawat. Our top story, the government has released a new advisory on coronavirus which warns that smaller aerosol particles can be carried in the air for 10 meters. The guidelines also include double masks, social distancing and well-ventilated spaces. The use of proper ventilation can prevent the spread of coronavirus. The union government's principal scientific advisor, K. Rag Vijay Raghavan's office says also that running air conditioners while keeping windows and doors shut traps infected air inside the room and increases the risk of transmission from an infected carrier to others. Now, if the vaccination drive against coronavirus is not ramped up and COVID-appropriate behavior is not maintained, there is a possibility of a third wave of the pandemic in six to eight months, a panel of scientists has said. They're involved in the Sutra model, which, in, which uses mathematics to project the trajectory of COVID. I spoke to Dr. M. Vidya Sagar, National Science Chair, IIT Hyderabad, on these projections. When we looked at the second wave, to a fairly large extent, it was triggered by, of course, people not following COVID protocols, but also by the fact that the people who had developed immunity during the first wave saw that immunity erode over a, a period of time. Now, recent scientific research suggests that people who do have developed, who have developed immunity uh, will lose them after about six to eight months' time. So now in the present wave, the number of people who have been infected is about 30% more than it was in the first wave. So these people will also have immunities, but they will erode over about a six to eight months time period. So the question is, what are we to do to cope with this erosion of immunity? And one rather obvious approach is to vaccinate people to compensate for the loss of immunity. If we're able to do that sufficiently fast, then after six to eight months, we may have a slight bump in cases, but it should not be anything very spectacular like what we have seen this time. Right. Uh, Professor, also, you talk about how the second wave uh, could, uh, we don't want to say end, because let's not make that mistake again, like we made with the first wave of, you know, thinking that it, it was behind us, but that cases could go down to, you know, 15 to 25,000 uh, by the end of June. Yes, because we have created this portal, uh, which is based on our mathematical model, and it is called sutra-india.in, uh, and it gives a projection for not just uh, the all of India, but also for individual states. And we expect that by the end of June, the number of cases should be somewhere in the low tens of thousands. So 10, 15, 20, 25,000, something of that order. We also have detailed projections for not just uh, all of India, but also for individual states. And also for some of the larger states, we have projections for uh, the larger districts as well. Right, sir. Sir, uh, also what we have seen in the second wave is the new variants and they have been, uh, you know, said to be more infectious and that is one of the reasons that we've seen uh, the, uh, the COVID infection spreading so rapidly. So does this uh, model account or are you taking uh, this into account that there could possibly be more mutations? Yes, we are definitely taking into account. See, the model incorporates a parameter which the epidemiology community denotes by the Greek letter beta, uh, and it stands for the contact rate. And what it does is it computes the probability that when an infected person comes into contact with a susceptible person, that means a person who doesn't have immunity, what is the likelihood that an infection will take place? And this likelihood depends on a number of factors. Uh, interestingly, the most important factor is not the variant. The most important factor is whether the two people who come into contact are following the COVID pro protocols or not. Are they maintaining social distancing? Are they properly masked up? Do they avoid any touching and so on? So the variant contributes, depending on uh, the situation, approximately 20-30% of uh, an increase in beta but what we have seen is that between the first wave and the second wave, uh, beta increased by a factor of about 60%. So what makes up for this extra 30-40% is the fact that people have stopped following COVID protocols. So we'll be watching for future variants if there are any, and we will be able to incorporate them into our model. 
Right, so now when you talk about increasing or ramping up vaccinations, uh, what, what are the numbers uh, that you're talking about currently? 18.7 uh, uh, crore people are vaccinated in the country. Uh, yesterday, our vaccination was just 11, uh, just 11 lakh 66 thousand, and that's very, uh, you know, it's much less than what experts have been saying. We've been saying that it should be over 50 lakhs, over 80 lakhs a day if we're to get any amount of protection to the public. So what are your estimates on that? So I, I'm not really competent to speak about things like vaccine availability. Sure. I know that the I'm government has I'm not asking about signed... vaccine availability, but your projections and how much of the population do you think needs yeah. to be vaccinated as fast as possible? Sure. No, that, that's a very good question. So that I can uh, take a stab at answering. So we need to vaccinate at a bare minimum around 50 to 60 percent of the adult population. So our adult population in India is around 90 crores. So around, say, 60% is about 55 crores. And it's not entirely clear whether one dose is sufficient to ward off the third wave or both doses are required. Both doses being given, of course, would be definitely good enough. So if you have something of the order of 100 crores doses administered by, we're in May now, so let's say by end of January next year, that is sort of barely good enough. And anything beyond that is, is a bonus. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vidya Sagar, for speaking to us here at thank NGTV. You. Thank you. Well, let's now turn to Europe, where more and more countries are easing COVID restrictions following a drop in the case numbers. It's a relief for businesses, especially in the hardest hit sectors. But many fear that too great a relaxation might undo the achievements of the month long, month long shutdown measures. For more, we're joined by DW correspondent Nicole Frolik, who joins us from Berlin. Thank you so much for joining us, Nicole. So tell us restrictions are being lifted in many places, but life is not yet back to normal, is it? Not at all. What we're seeing across the board really are baby steps. There is a great awareness of how volatile the situation is and the trauma of the past months, not only the devastating human costs of the pandemic, but also the psychological damage and the social rift that have come out of this crisis have decision makers treading very carefully. This week, we're seeing a very slight easing of curfew rules in Italy. France is winding down its third national lockdown. Greece just recently dropped quarantine mandates for foreign travel. And England is proceeding with gradual reopening for now, that is, because there are worries about an increasing number of people becoming infected with the coronavirus variant first detected in India. Here in Germany, the situation very much depends on where you are. Regions can ease restrictions if the infection rate drops and stabilizes, something that's just happened here in the capital of Berlin, but will have to go back into lockdown if numbers rise again. So citizens are being urged not to get carried away with their new freedoms, keep Keep up social distancing and hygiene measures to make sure this third wave of the virus really is the last. Now, Germany has also announced a shift in its vaccination strategy. Uh, what's that about? Well, on Monday, Germany's health minister announced that starting in June, every adult over the age of 16 will be eligible to get vaccinated. That means that the current priority list, putting the vulnerable and exposed ahead in the queue, will no longer apply. Vaccines will be given out on a first-come, first-served basis to anyone who wants them. But that sounds a lot easier than it actually is. A number of states had already ditched prioritization to speed up the process, but that has often ended in chaos, with demand drastically exceeding supply. Doctor's offices overwhelmed with requests or people waiting for hours just to be sent home unvaccinated. Vaccination centers here in Berlin currently have a wait list until the end of July. I checked this morning, so infrastructure processes and vaccine availability will have to be considerably improved for everybody to actually be able to get a shot when they want one. All right, thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us there. Well, let's now talk more about COVID management. And to talk about that, we're now joined by public health expert, Dr. Matthew Verghese, whose videos on managing COVID through different timelines and watching out for the worrying signs have gone viral. Uh, sir, you so lucidly explained the disease in that video, and it's been shared many times. I've received it so many times uh, from various friends and relatives. So, Dr. Verghese, one of the big challenges during the second wave for COVID patients has been to realize when is, when is the situation getting out of hand and when you need to be alarmed and, you know, uh, uh, talk to your doctor, get to a hospital? So if you could explain that to us.
Um, sorry, I think I've lost the audio. No, I, we're getting your audio, Dr. Vergis. If you can go ahead and tell us, this, this is a very crucial aspect during the second wave, especially of when yeah. you need to accelerate, uh, you know, your worries and go to the hospital. Yeah, it's uh, thank you so much for having me. It's it's a real uh, decision making um, problem that we have been going through. The first wave, the virus wasn't that virulent enough to cause symptoms so early. But when we follow the patterns of the illness, and I have been following the pattern of the illness by documenting case by case for the last one and a half years, what is happening to every case. And we found that when you have the first symptom, from the first symptom, what the patient has is maybe a little cold, maybe a little sniffle, maybe a little fever, maybe a little cough, whatever is that, the most minor symptom that becomes important. Patient usually remembers what troubled him the most. But what is important is the first minor symptom is what is look at. And from there, you start your countdown. And first two, three days from that symptom, patient usually has only minor symptoms and nothing else. After two, three days, and that is because of the virus causing viremia and the body trying to fight the viremia by, by using antibody that has been generated against the virus. After this, there is a lull in terms of symptoms. The fever comes down, cough settles down a little bit, patient starts feeling better, I'm okay. In 80% of the cases, this stops here and there's nothing more that happens. They are happy and nothing more is required. But in about 15 to 20 percent, they start this second lull before the storm. After the lull, they have a fever coming back again. After the lull, they have the cough, which comes back with real bad bouts of cough. After the lull, they have a little congestion that they feel in their chest, and that really troubles them. So these three, the most important of this is fever, which is low grade, suddenly becomes high grade. Fever, which went down on the fourth day, third day, comes back at 100, 101. And that is and another mistake which people do is they keep taking paracetamol. Paracetamol puts your fever down and you may miss that fever that is coming on as the oncoming of the storm. So before the storm hits you, there is a shower, there is a little problem that comes up. And that is usually fever going up, cough becoming bad, and your congestion is what patients describe it. There's a little congestion that is there. I feel a little uncomfortable, but it's not breathlessness. And they all check their saturation at this time. Sir, right. my saturation is 97%. My saturation is 97%. And they are told to sit at home. They are told not to do anything other than taking those, those that handful of drugs that they get from their physicians, which is vitamin B, vitamin C, vitamin D, ivermectin, doxycycline, azithromycin. These six, seven drugs, all of them get, and that's the end of it. But none of these things can attack the storm that is coming for you. The storm is, it's an impending storm on the fifth day or on the sixth day. Usually it's five plus minus one. A fourth night, if they're having the fever spike, I tell them, don't take crocin. Watch for the next day morning. If you're having severe fever of 100 plus, watch out. You're in for trouble. You need to start medicines. And the only medicine that work at this stage are two, the steroids and the anticoagulants. Right. Don't now, steroids should you. not be started in the first five days. Right. We'll, we'll just get to the stairs, but a very important point you yeah. made because so far we've just been talking about measuring your oxygen levels and, you know, seeing your oxygen saturation and only worrying if it goes uh, below 92. But you're saying you actually need to watch out for that fever spiking. You need to watch out for chest congestion. You need to watch out for uh, if, if you have a, some kind of a dry cough. Yeah, precisely. In fact, I have been following these patients. So those patients that had their saturation good and they put on these medicines, they did well, the steroids and the anticoagulants. Those patients that waited to get to the hospital, they had a stormy outcome. They went on to intensive care units. Many of them went on to the ventilators and had problem. It is observing these patients, following them up meticulously. I found this difference. Don't wait for the saturation to drop. Your saturation drops when your lungs, both lungs, have been significantly damaged. Because, why is that so? It is because your lungs have a lot of spare capacity. And even if a substantial part of your lung is damaged, 
the spare capacity kicks in to function and maintain that saturation on the digital oxygen sensor right. to be 95 96 and this mistake has been done not just in india around the world to wait till the saturation dips and then go to the hospital and the hospital will need to put you on oxygen and starting with nasal cannula mask then non rebreathing mask then high flow nasal catheter then bipap cpap then ventilator the full work and then if you're really bad you go on to extra corporeal membrane oxy oximeter which is known as ecmos right. that's too late so you're saying that that's all too late Doctor, Don't you've wait also for that. emphasized I, I saw in your video you've emphasized ab about counting from the day you get the first symptom from when you develop it and this is something people often miss they don't know was it when i got a severe headache was it when i developed fever uh, you know so it's important for you to realize what you're going through and you know try to uh, you know uh, Put some effort into real and in, into finding out what was that first day. Yeah. So, I, I, how did I, I understand this? When early on in in uh, when I maintained a diary, I started maintaining a diary as soon as the pandemic started. Just because I thought it's a one in a millennium incident, I might as well maintain a diary. Maybe when I'm old, I can write a you know journal on this. But then I didn't realize as patients started calling me up, I thought, what is happening to many started start calling me up. You no. Know, they started, no, I'm having problem. So I started maintaining the diary and soon I realized I need to maintain the time tracking of what's happening to them when. And I saw the pattern evolving before me. By August, September, I was very clear. The last wave, it was usually six, seven days. In this wave, it is four or five days. And if you follow this and put them on these medicines, all the patients that I followed up, I started treating. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm not yes. a physician. Yes. But the problem was they didn't want to go to the hospital because they were not allowed to go to the hospital. First, they had to have a COVID report and then they can't enter without the COVID report. Then they have to wait for hours and they're not sure if they are COVID positive or not. So they are afraid of exposing themselves to the patients around the casualty. Sure. They will say, doctor, doctor, you only tell us what to do. And from my understanding and my readings, I told them what I had to do. And that was usually steroids and anticoagulants. But warn them, never, never start the steroid too early because you'll prolong your illness viremia and there are patients who have been continuing the steroids no dangerous right. that is why you're having you're having this epidemic of mucormycosis Absolutely. continuous steroid use right. and, uh, starting it too early starting it too continuing it too long and also a lot of 20 percent of delhi people are diabetics 20 percent so in our metro cities the diabetic percentage is very high and if they are put on these steroids their diabetics goes for haywire so please right. Diabetes use it intelligently, get in bomb. touch with your diabetologist and take care. Absolutely, and very important point which is, doctors is. have been making about the timing of your steroids and never take them without consulting your doctors. Uh, doctor, we're going to slip into a short break. We're going to open this up for questions from our viewers. Many questions have already come in for you. We'll slip into a short break with this uh, message uh, from uh, Dr. Verghese's video. Welcome back. Well, we're opening up for our viewer questions now, and we have Dr. Vergis with us to answer all those questions. We have one caller uh, with us, Anil Gurung. Uh, go ahead with your question. Uh, I'm calling from Gurung. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my question is that if I am wearing N95 double mask, yes, and if I come across a asymptomatic person who is infected. Will I still get the infection? All right, Dr. Vargis? Yeah. I couldn't hear the last part, but I think if, I can guess the question. If he's wearing an N95 mask, he comes across an asymptomatic, an asymptomatic person, person who's not wearing a mask. Who's not wearing a mask, what is the probability of you getting an infection? So if two people are interacting, both are wearing a mask, the probability is very low. If one is wearing a mask and the other is not wearing a mask, there are studies on this. The estimate is about 17% probability of getting infected. The other one is not wearing a mask. Those are there are there in research papers. But as, as a physician, I am seeing corona patients, you know, almost every other day, um, every day uh, sometimes, and interacting with them. All I do is I make sure I keep my mask on. It never comes down. My nose is covered. This is always just taken it out for the for the session. It's always there. And I don't touch this surface because virus is filtered here. If I touch this, I always have a sanitizer which I sanitize. And when I take it out, I'll always take it out using the strings. 
take it out using the string and put it away without anybody allowed to be touched so if you're wearing a mask you're protected and i have interacted with screaming children corona positive not wearing a mask and i have been protected just the mask so that's the important and the sanitization uh, nothing else. i don't wear a ppe when i'm at work all right we have another caller satish from delhi go ahead yeah good afternoon i have a question uh, regarding the efficacy of the vaccines now because recently a renowned doctor mr dr kk agarwal has recently died of covid and uh, probably has taken both the vaccines and uh, he has just died with yeah, yes, covid yes he did this is put a question for vaccination right dr vargis a lot of questions regarding this go yeah. ahead so the yes absolutely the lots of doubt says the vaccine uh, f it because they know people who have had vaccine have died not in having a vaccine now let's let's understand this what do the companies tell you about the efficacy the extra zenka says about 70% the pfizer uh, moderna they say about 90% it leaves you a 10% for the pfizer moderna it leaves you 30% for the others so there is a 30% probability that it may not work for you and that is why the importance of this mask even if you have had your vaccine you need to assume that you are likely to still get it and therefore protect yourself this mask is more important than having just the vaccine vaccine will prevent you from having a severe disease but occasionally you may belong to that 30% or that 10% where you may still have the disease and you may get and usually what happens is it's usually physicians they tend to ignore their illness they know best so they think that they know best but it's treating yourself can be dangerous it's best to get in touch with the next expert before it becomes too late so this important to understand this aspect vaccines protect you but not a hundred percent right and that needs to be emphasized so if you uh, you know are eligible for vaccines then just go ahead and get vaccinated because you will get some protection from that thank you so much uh, dr vargis for joining us uh, on the show and answering all those questions for us thank you thank you well that's all the time we have on the show today thanks for watching goodbye